it takes about 35 hours a week to actually take care of a child. You've got now, what, four rentals behind you and a PPR totaling around the three mil mark. It's too late for me to start investing in property. I've got kids. How many times have you heard someone say that? Or maybe even said it to yourself? Our guest today, Esther and Murray, prove it is never too late to start building a property portfolio, even if you've got <laughs> little ones in tow. I didn't even Quite know it was a thing until Murray opened my eyes to it. The first time I really learned about equity was with that first property we were told that we couldn't borrow anything at all by one mortgage broker we met a friend and she said no that's not right you should definitely f and then a couple of weeks later we got approved for a million dollar purchase understanding how a small business owning family overcome the hurdles to build a secure financial future for them and their kids nothing in life worth having just falls into your lap it's determination we just really wanted to get there we just weren't taking no for an answer taking us through the ups and downs of being parents and business owners and how they've managed to include property investing into the mix. We'd been working pretty hard, jumped through a couple of different accountants and yep. spoken to a bank. We were very, very eager, but not as educated as I would say we are now. How do you genuinely find the time to do this? If you're doing it as a, a couple, as a family, you need it. If you or anyone you know wants to start building a property portfolio and you've either got a young family or expecting one on the way, you're going to enjoy this episode. And if you've got a friend coming to mind that you think could benefit from this, click that share button and send it to them. Because the story we're about to unfold from Esther and Murray could be the spark that lights the fuse on some property investing dynamite. My name's Todd Sloan. This is the Pizza and Property Podcast. And you're listening to my chat with a mum and dad from an everyday Aussie family, Esther and Murray. Esther and Murray. How are you guys going? Yeah, We're good, good thanks. Thanks for having us. It's an absolute pleasure to have you both here. It's uh, becoming a little bit more of a habit now interviewing a couple of people at once, but um, I think you guys have got such a cool story to share about building a portfolio with kids. There is so many people out there that just think well, it's, it's over now. We've got kids. We didn't start young enough. We can't do it. You're sitting in front of me both as proof that that's not the case. And it's not like you guys have bought a property even if that was the case, it'd still be awesome. But you've got now, what, four rentals behind you and a PPR totaling around the three mil mark. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And you've done this all in what kind of time frame? 19 months. Yeah. Okay. So you, you're not big time wasters. <laughs> no, it feels like a whirlwind, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah. bet. <laughs> Pause to take a breath. <laughs> well, I wanted to, to jump in straight away with the equity side of things because you had the PPR it did okay and it actually didn't just do okay it did, did pretty well but lazy equity is a really big thing there's a lot of people that might be sitting around with hundreds of thousands in some cases millions of dollars literally just sitting there doing nothing can you kind of open up a little bit about when the penny really dropped for that how you accessed it and how the financing side of things really came about oh god i don't even know where to start with that i think um we're into our third ppr now yep. the first time i really learned about equity was with that first property mm -hmm. and then we were oh god we were told that we couldn't borrow anything at all by one mortgage broker and and what year was this roughly oh this was just before the COVID boom this was around late 2019 or early 2020. And you got told zeros. We got told zero dollars and we'd been working pretty hard. We jumped through a couple of different accountants and, yep. and spoken to a bank, went to this mortgage broker who was greatly recommended and he said, no, sorry, I can't get you anything. Okay. And obviously you didn't, didn't take, take no, no for an no? answer. Okay. Sure. <laughs> I actually met a friend through horse riding who yep. worked for a mortgage broker and she said, no, that's not right. You should definitely be able to get something. And then a couple of weeks later, we got approved for a million dollar purchase. So It went from zero to a million. $950,000 loan. How, how Okay. <laughs> so was the first guy just like didn't care, didn't really try I, or was I the next one a wizard? I think he had a very small selection of lenders okay. he was working with and that his ego and his story was bigger than what he could actually produce. Can I ask, though, what gave you guys the confidence to actually go, nah, they're wrong, I'm going to keep going? Because most people would just go, oh, okay, we tried, didn't work. Well, I don't know if it was confidence, it's more like just determination. We just, we just could, just keen, you know, we just really wanted to get to, you know, get there and... Uh, we just weren't taking no for an answer. You know, 
with, with him or in any other closed doors sort of, you know? It just didn't make sense. Like the interest rates were so low mm-hmm. and we had so much equity in the home we were in. And so Work-wise, what were you guys doing at the time? Because you both work together now like in the family business? Yeah. Yeah? Um, I believe we were both painting then. Had I started painting? Close to it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you, you're both working together and, and the business is doing pretty good, but you're not like hmm. making millions a year. It's not shooting the lights out. Just steady, yeah. Okay. I actually think if we can talk numbers, I think that year that we got approved for the 950000 I think our household income was only just over a hundred grand. That's insane. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so you've got PPR with how much equity are we talking then? The equity we had in that property at that time was over a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you're starting with a solid equity base, For sure, yeah. but but then your first broker's saying you can't even borrow. Mm-hmm. You're going, nah, stuff you. We're, we're finding someone that says yes. Then you, as far as your serviceable income is concerned, 100 grand, but like that's pretty conservative for a household income. But then they're going, we'll give you 950 odd thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. Are you just guys, you go into town and it's like, yeah. let's, let's start buying? <laughs> we were not... We were very, very eager, but not as educated as I would say we are now. Yep. We got in our heads that we wanted to buy something to live in. So we ended up buying uh, a duplex, a single duplex, 200 metres down the road. <laughs> and and why close? Was that just because you, you researched and close was doing well? Like, Because you're at Central well, Coast? Oh, we just got caught up in the hype. And we just wanted to stay in the area of like with the, you know, Cabarita Beach, New yep. South Wales. We just wanted to stay in that area. And at the time it was kind of like. It was booming it was, and it we just thought it and couldn't slow down. FOMO. Like we got major FOMO. Yeah. Yep. And but. But. We used that as a stepping stone to get into our family home that we're in now. So we would never have had the confidence to sell the original PPR if we hadn't bought that duplex to live in. Okay. And so when you bought the duplex, you were renovating it and adding value or was it all done? It was definitely in a renovator. We bought it, moved in and sort of, yeah, just had to just spruce a few things up, you know, paint, definitely the kitchen. The kitchen was just falling apart completely. And it just, just over time, I think we were there for... Nearly two years. Yeah, well... Yeah. And and looking at the numbers of the property now, given the property investing knowledge that you've acquired over the years, is it still a good deal or would you not have pulled the trigger on it knowing what you know now? I definitely wouldn't have pulled the trigger on it. It wasn't a good investment, but in saying that, the original PPR we had, mm-hmm. we spruced that up and because we had the duplex to live in, we were confident to sell that because the layout of it wasn't great. It was in a really good location. It had a plumbing easement in the backyard so Mm -hmm. we couldn't extend we couldn't put in a pool and we just spruced that up did a cosmetic renovation ourselves and then we sold that for 1.4 and what'd you what'd you end up walking away with oh it was i think we had nine nine hundred grand in the bank or 800 grand from that sale that's fantastic Mm. Mm. okay and is this where and then like is, is the property bug officially bitten now? Yeah. So, cause a lot of people will buy one and then it's like, okay, cool. We're done. Um, I'm addicted. Okay. I'm so addicted to it. <laughs> and, and so wh- where to from there? What was the next step? Oh, then we just went hard looking for a family home. Mm-hmm. So we we're looking around, looking around. We wanted something just with a really nice layout, but we didn't want something pretty because We've got big imaginations Mm -hmm. and we don't like paying. We're very, very aware of how much more you pay for something that someone else has made pretty. Mm. We don't like paying full price. Yeah, we don't like, we like bargains. (laughs) We don't like bargains, so definitely undervalue. Yeah. And and where did you learn this? Was this like you started reading more podcasts, TV? Uh, What's it coming from? I've I've used this method for a long time with horses and, and saddles and um, buying and selling and making money from things that other people do, don't see value in because it's not well advertised, it's not polished up, mm-hmm. they haven't taken nice photos. I've done that quite successfully in the past with horses and with horse gear. People like, you know, just don't know how to present things for sale or okay. often, like I know I'm turning this around onto horses now, but it's the same thing with property, like people don't know what they have. 
So but that's kind so, of more how you learn how to make a deal. Yeah. And then we just, yeah, with listening to podcasts and just being in the trade we're in as painters, we walk into houses all day, you know, every week we're going into different houses and yep. we're transforming them with mm. a bit of paint. So when this house, I'd been ringing all the agents and then this house hit the market, it was a copper's log cabin mm-hmm. around the corner, all orange pine cladding inside and old Just carpet. Full original. And grandma yes. furniture everywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think there was about. You got some photos you can share on this oh, one? For sure. oh, we do. Yeah. yeah. About yeah. 1,500 DVDs. Eight, um, eight garbage bags full of DVDs. Yeah. <laughs> I got a photo of our so, son just swimming in DVDs. Yeah. Oh, he thought they were great. He doesn't even know what they are. <laughs> um, it was an agent not from that location. So he didn't know that that was actually a duplex zoned location. The owner was going into a nursing home. Mm-hmm. It had been her family home for 30 years. So you spotted opportunity. Yeah, yeah. We walked in and we loved it. Like we were like, wow, this place has so much character and so much potential. But so many other people were like, this is a knockdown. To be um, honest though, when we were there, there was like, you know, the usual, like, uh, you know, big wigs rolling up in there, you know, Range Rovers and developers mm-hmm. and stuff. And we just roll in, we like basically in our work clothes. And I said to us, I said, let's just go. We don't have we're a not going to get this. We're we not, don't have, we're a chance. have a chance. The agent, he said to us, look, like, put your best foot forward, put any extra conditions. They do want a quick sale. Mm-hmm. We'll be closing expressions of interest in, you know, five days or whatever it was. And they would like whoever buys it to take it as is with everything in it. Okay. Hence the 1500 DVDs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, so I put my heart and soul into this offer. Mm-hmm. Probably went a little bit above what we could actually wanted to pay because he said it would be it would be one and only offer put in your best offer and that's it there'll be no negotiating i wrote a letter saying how much we wanted that to be our family home and that the bonus would be that we lived around the corner so we wouldn't have to dismantle the trampoline you could just wheel it up the road (laughs) (laughs) out of interest who gave you that idea because that i actually had that years ago when i was an agent and that that worked really well. Mm-hmm. And I would hand, like, n- not handwrite. I, that sounds terrible. I would give handwritten letters from a purchaser and and it makes you human. You're yeah. no longer just like an offer within many. Pulls Who told- the heartstrings. Do you know, know what? Yeah. It was actually the agent that encouraged me to do it who was selling. Interesting. Because the other offers that were coming in were from developers. And from I the think Range Rovers. He knew, yeah. yeah. He knew, like, mm-hmm. they would favour a family. Mm. Um, and they were going to knock it down. Yeah. And the lady that was living there, she wanted another family to live in the property. You know, she raised the kids. She wanted another family to do the same. She wanted you know, knocked down. So, you know. Yeah, we got a phone call later that night. And he well, he sent me a text message first, actually. And he said, Esther, are you free to talk? And then he called. Yeah. And he said, you've got it. And it wasn't the highest offer. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. So it was that important to this vendor that you guys were going to retain the home and not just bulldoze it and develop. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that's such a good lesson when it comes to actually gathering information when you're going to offer on a property. Yeah. And just putting it all like we, if it had come down to dollar value, mm-hmm. like we, we didn't think we were going to get it. We didn't think we were going to get it. And we thought, we well, already had you got to be plans. in it to win it. Yeah, we, yeah. We, I just scrapped it from my mind, you know, thinking, oh, well, you know, we don't have a chance. Judging by all the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the developers that were there and it's like, you just think, you know, well, we're just, we're only small time compared to those people. So, yeah. So, and this, this is now investment property. So you got the PPR and this is kind of technically investment property number one, correct? This was becoming our PPR. This is becoming your PPR. So what we did, we bought that property yep. and then we cleaned it out. This uh-huh. was just before Christmas because for some reason we've done multiple do- deals just before Christmas. 2019 or 2020? This was late 2022. Late 2022, okay. Just before Christmas. So uh, pause for a second then. Uh, um, if you're getting the uh, 2019, you're getting 
the approval. Yeah, and then so, we bought the duplex. Oh, gotcha. Yep, yep, yep. And then we now. sold the original PPR, moved yep. into the duplex after renting that out as well and that Airbnb being it. Airbnb yeah. was shit. I would Didn't work. Never, no, it was just painful. Oh, it's it like was, you get a call on Christmas, literally Christmas night. Uh, the fan's not working. Can you bring can a can fan you? over? Like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I do hear that from people. Airbnb yeah. seems to be the kind of thing, if you do it like well and it works well, it's really good. But otherwise it's like it can yeah. just be an absolute time That's suck. That's what I've told people. Like yeah. just get – unless you really like people, yeah. like get someone else to manage it for you because yeah, yeah, yeah. I spent years and years and years in hospitality and I'm just not a people pleaser anymore. All right. I wanted to ask. I got started later. Okay. I bought my first PPR – you guys are listening to the show. You probably heard me complain about it. Uh, it was a terrible choice. An apartment on North Terrace just down the road here. Bought it to impress a girl. Um, ended up making hardly any money on it. even to hold it for like 10 years. Almost like the classic sort of bad story. But it wasn't until my early 30s that I went, oh, i got to do something with this. What was it? Because it sounds like to me, you guys have both got that deal-making, work ethic, kind of hustle mentality why Why were you a bit later to property? Why Why wasn't this something that like the bug was bitten earlier? Well, because I'd he hadn't met me. For, yeah. <laughs> Murray yeah. couldn't do it without me. You're the he catalyst, eh? Yeah. He wanted to and he tried and he I, got knocked down and he didn't have the right people supporting him. You guys and really are a team, aren't you? When we came together and worked together, that's when it really took off. Can you tell me a little bit about that then, Murray? Like, so you, you wanted to, you felt like well, this property stuff's got some legs about it. Oh, I've been trying since I was in my, like, 20s for sure. But I just, I don't know, I, ne I couldn't quite grasp the whole financials of it all. Like, I knew that, like, you know, buying houses and, you know, flipping or, you know, in, in general, mm -hmm. will, you know, create wealth. But I just couldn't get, like, how to get finance. I just, you know, I was, I was always working, but the, you know, the finance, you know, brokers would be like, oh, you're not, didn't earn enough or, you know, it was just sort of, I don't know, I just couldn't get it over the line. Like it was um, very difficult. So Esther is the yin to your yang. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay. Well, he got the first one. He bought the first property before me. Which gave you guys a, a, a huge springboard on the equity. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. But then you were the one that kind of like grabbed it and ran with it together. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So it wasn't that you didn't want to start earlier. It was that you, by the sounds of things, you really didn't know how until you found each other. Mm. That's right. I was just keeping okay. like roadblocks, you know. I didn't even financial. know it was a thing until Murray opened my eyes to it. I thought investing was something that people did when they already had money. So. So time is one of the big things. I, I spoke to a lot of friends before we actually started writing the questions for this episode. And the first thing that they all wanted to know is like, how do you get the money for it? Which by the sounds of things, you guys are already saying there's a few uh, parts to it. You used equity in the house. You weren't afraid to do that. You ended up not taking no for an answer when it came time to find a broker. And you would just keep pushing until you found the answer that you wanted. You took action as soon as you got that money as well. You added value. You weren't just looking at like, okay, we're just going to buy this, walk away, and then just expect everything to come up millhouse for us. Like we wanted to, to actually get dirty, get get mm -hmm. it going. The time piece, that's a big side of this. They say on average, what is, I've actually got a quote here. So they say on average, it takes about 35 hours a week to actually take care of a child. Now, this is obviously an average, and these have been put together as estimates from people. As a soon-to-be dad myself, 35 hours sounds doable, but I've got a feeling it might be a lot more with a newborn. But getting back to the whole question side of things that came in from a lot of people is you, you're working full-time. You guys are running a business. Yeah. Like, you've got kids. How do you genuinely find the time to do this? You just make the time. If it's a priority, you'll find the time. It's important. And the way we look at it is... It's we don't have one business, we have two. So you look at it as we've got a property business and a painting business. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Okay. And thankfully with the type of work we do, we can spend a lot of time making phone calls while we're at work because we wear the hands-free earpieces. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when we're doing a property deal, like, oh, I remember there's been a job on – jobs on where we've been doing deals and working with other tradesmen and they're like, you yeah. never get off the phone, Esther. 
because I'm just constant phone, phone calls, phone calls, phone calls, phone calls. But at the same time, I'm painting. Yeah. I've got a brush in my <clears> hand and I'm painting and I'm making phone calls. So you're driving to and from places. Just like multitasking, higher functioning. Mm. <laughs> Proper multitasking by the sounds of it. Yeah. Okay, and, and what, what kind of calls are you making? Are you talking to agents? Agents, doing- our buyer's agent friend. Mm-hmm. I've spent a lot of time talking to him. The mortgage broker, the accountants, like anyone that will give me what I need. So let's say it's the start of the day. It's early. You've done the school run. You, you've, you've made lunches. You've, you've done everything that you need to do. You're in the car. You've got the tools with you. It's time to get to work. Do you have like a, a chunk of the start of the day where you're like, okay, I've got this call list. Like when are you, when are you starting to organize that side yeah. of the business while you're working in the painting business? How does this work? I have horrendous organization skills. Okay. So if I think of something, I do it there and then. So this is all so, off the cuff. Yeah. What makes you think of it? I don't know. It's just on the forefront of my mind because it's so important to us to build this. Like we want freedom and flexibility. Like we don't want to be dictated by the man about when we put our tools down. We so, want we want to have our own choice. So. so none of this is coming from like, okay, I've got a spreadsheet. I need to do no X, way. Y, and Z. Zero spreadsheets. No, it's I don't just... even know how to make a spreadsheet. Maybe some reminders on the phone or yeah, something Yeah, I send like a lot that. of alarms alarm, maybe. on my phone okay. to remind me of things. Or from myself. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it seems to be working. Yeah. Yeah. So when people are going, I don't have the time, you, you guys are saying you, you need to just find the time. Make the time. Squeeze it Wake in. up earlier. You know, like like I think we said it before this, um, one of the things I've gotten out of listening to your podcast and other people's podcasts is that a lot of successful property investors wake up very early and go mm-hmm. to the gym. And mm-hmm. then they start their day. And that's something I started doing just over a year ago. And it's the best thing I've ever done. It's good, isn't it? So I feel like I was like wasting two hours of the day sleeping. Mm. When I could have been up exercising or, you know, I've even started riding my horses before I go to work now or deal with the kids. You ever ride it to and work? Just make an entrance? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> and then um, it's great because like being a mum or like, so much of the responsibility of being the primary parent falls on you. And because I always finish work early and pick the kids up and do all the runarounds, but it means for those first two hours of the morning, like when the kids wake up, it's all Murray. So it kind of gives us a little bit more balance. Can you guys open up a little bit about that? If you don't mind sharing like the, the actual routine of it between the two of you, because I'd imagine that's probably a huge part to play in this. Like, so, so you're up at like 5 a.m. Esther. Yeah. And then what, Murray, it's it's your turn to what, like make lunches and stuff in the morning? Pretty much, yeah. Just get the kids sorted and then, uh, you know, and just spend time with the kids, you know, because most tradies are out the door by six or, you know, seven. Yeah. And the kids, you know, they, they would be seeing their kids in the morning, whereas I'm sort of, you know, I'm lucky enough to We've be able to- We've got that flexibility. Yeah, flexibility. I can spend some time with the kids before I go to work. And yeah, it's just, it just works. It's great. And okay. then Murray generally works longer hours than me. I just finish when I need to, go pick up the kids and get any errands done that need to be done and, yeah. So you, you're both working to a schedule that suits the family, also suits the businesses, but you, the thing that, that really blows my mind about this is you haven't set down this, like, rigid structure. No. It sounds like you've got a few alarms on your phone that maybe keep things a bit in order, but like, what's really driving this then? You said before you don't want to have be told what to do by the man. This is about like having it on your mm. terms. But like, there's there's a lot of chutzpah. There's a lot of energy behind this. What's what's the push? Because it'd be so much easier not to do this. I think you know we've both come from families like our parents have always worked hard and been battlers. And growing up, we always had what we needed, but there was never any excess. And It's just having that uneasy feeling of not, you know, like having that security behind you. Like we don't want that. And and you see people like retiring and relying on a pension and we just, we don't want the government to tell us when we can retire. We want want that freedom. We want to have freedom. We Mm. want, you know, it was like when that light bulb went on and we saw other, you know, average everyday people building property portfolios and then being able to pursue something just because it was something they were passionate about Mm. because they didn't have to worry about where the next bill was going to be paid from. Like, 
So it's got nothing to do with Ferraris for you guys? No. 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 We want more time with our kids. We want, you know, to still be fairly young mm -hmm. and not be like told you have to work these hours, you have to work for this long. And, you know, I've worked on a lot of job sites over the years. You, you always see that that old bloke, 70 plus old bloke, who just hates his life. Mm. Just, you yeah. know, he just goes just grinding all the time. There's just know, so I'm much just more to like, life. Yeah. You There's know, so much more. I just want to and sort of think ahead a bit, set myself up so I'm not doing that. And like in, when I'm that age, I've, I've, you know, I'll still be doing stuff. I can't stop sort of thing, but just. You know, it'll be more own, following passions. You know, couple than of days a week, doing what he has to do. Yeah, he'll be mm. out metal detecting, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> surfing. <laughs> You're saying before that's a, a pretty lucrative like side hustle that you've got. Like, yeah. what was it like finding people's lost jewellery or something along those lines? Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. So coastal metal detecting. You know, someone loses their ring or their phone at the beach or anywhere yeah. really. They give just, you a bell. Yeah, yeah. They usually just Google because he most leaves time, me at work on the brush. Yeah, and he yeah. goes off. Always got the metal detector in the car, <laughs> and then off I go, save the day, and uh, yeah, everyone's happy. That's awesome. Yeah. So so far, everything's sounding pretty good. You guys are going from from property to property. You're, you're continuously building. You're juggling family, home, kids, relationship, business, all the rest of it. But it's not all like perfect sailing. What's one of the biggest challenges that you guys have had to overcome to really like continue this moving forward? I think sometimes we'll bite off a bit more than we can chew. How so? Uh, like for instance, um, when we were moving into our newest home, our mm -hmm. PPR, um, and we'd also were selling the duplex and we had two renovations going on at once just before Christmas. Okay. Was um, this intentional or did they just happen to overlap? Uh, it's just what happens. It's just what we do. <laughs> <It's> just <laughs> Organised chaos sometimes. Um, okay. <laughs> and so you, you're like darting between both of them? Basically, yeah. yeah. So we're just, you know, basically cosmetically renovating the duplex, you know, put in a new kitchen as well. And we'll then repaint and flooring. Repaint, exterior, interior, repaint. Um, gardens. Gardens. And then we had to basically, and then as soon as the tenants were out on the new house, mm -hmm. then we had to start there and- Gut that, and that was a huge, and, yeah. Yeah, but and that was then, a longer process with the builder come in and done, you know, a lot more structural things. And is this late nights or just like working through the weekends? How are you getting it done? Just every spare minute. I know in the lead up to Christmas, Murray was, I was pretty held up with the kids doing mm -hmm. what I could, but mostly my job then was to just parent and- because of that beautiful house and all the orange pine cladding inside, mm -hmm. which we wanted to keep that texture, mm -hmm. but we wanted to paint it white. Okay. So after about a week of gapping, Murray was smearing blood on Into, the yeah. blood, with the guts, <laughs> with the guts. So literally, uh, like blood, sweat, tears, and paint. Well, just because your fingers are he getting that. He was doing yeah, so much gap gapping. Filling. For, for anyone that like, doesn't understand gapping. Yeah. So it's just basically acrylic gap filler you know like if you have gaps in between sort of weatherboards things like that you just you know you just timber just has a lot of like cracks it. and holes and and so you're just like splinter city with your fingers pretty yeah. much yeah okay. just, it looks beautiful though yeah. but it was <laughs> i hope so it was like it's got a lot of a Murray's. week of straight of gap filling and yeah, <laughs> yeah just fingers to the bone pretty much and uh, jesus mate so yeah. it's looking like a crime scene in there yeah. Yeah. a, a yeah. pretty yeah. one yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the end <laughs> we wanted to be in for christmas but we didn't quite make it in in time. Well, like with any renovation, it sort of always blows out. So the chippies were a bit, I think they were a week or so late. Then, yeah, it was you know, Christmas. Then, Especially over Christmas. Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, so then they handed it over to us to paint literally and like then we were a few doing days the other place or as before well, Christmas. So. And yeah, and, and we had to, it had to be finished painted <laughs> before the other one settled and yeah it was just chaos that was pretty chaotic over christmas so that was yeah it. and so, then as usual like murray will always get sick when we're doing something like that because <laughs> it was not the first so you're first time. now you're doing this with a cold as well yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right yeah, yeah just add more pressure so you guys are serial jugglers like what why why not stop though this is the thing because it would have been so much easier not to renovate still keep investing still keep chasing like don't want to be told what to do by the man but like I, I talk to so many people that would go, oh, I tried this, it didn't work, it was a horrible experience, I'm not going to do it again. Where you guys are like, hey, that was a horrible experience, let's sign up for round two. <laughs> <laughs> Gluttons for punishment. What, what because of the benefit. 
So you're, you're seeing enough of an upside. Yeah, yeah, and it's not forever. It's a little bit of pain. Well, they say no pain, no gain. To talk to so, me about the little bit of the more so than not forever because I feel like that's something that when it comes to sacrifice, I think is really – I don't know if it's misunderstood but not taken into consideration enough. It's like the whole like moving back in with your folks. You don't do that for the rest of your life. Mm. But if you can do that for even six months, save up more of a deposit, get better serviceability with the banks, it can completely change your trajectory. That's right. And not saying everyone should do that, but a, a three-month, six-month, 12-month sacrifice can literally be a it's life changer. such a small window of time in the scheme of things. And if you just keep looking and thinking about that goal, it makes it a lot more, you know, achievable. And you guys big into what, like your, your vision board side of things, you're doing morning, man. How you, like, what do you do to keep it focused? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Definitely nothing like that. We just. Yeah. We've just know. got it in here. Yeah. Like when, and, you know, we do listen to a lot of podcasts. Mm -hmm. That helps just get us, you know, really motivated listening to other people that have done the same thing because you know that it's achievable. Like, well, someone else has done it and. It's doable. Got, yeah, yeah, it's doable. It's That's achievable. Right. Like nothing in work, life worth having just falls into your lap. Yeah. Usually you have, mm. you have to be pretty bloody lucky. Like you don't, you know, like that famous saying, like the harder you work, the luckier you get. So, so true. Mm. Like, yeah. So when it comes to the biggest challenge, what I'm hearing is it, it's, again, you, you kept doing it anyway, but basically it was spinning more plates than you were already spinning and it was renovating, literally working your fingers to the bone and just pushing through, just yeah. finding a way to push through again. Mm -hmm. That's right. And once yeah. you've started, like you can't really tap out. Like you're in there, so you just got to see it through. Well, and it's very expensive if you do. Yeah. Try and sell a renovation project mid renovations, not you a good just, idea. Yeah. You just can't do that, you know? So. Speaking of the Renault side of things, and I wanted to, to ask you this specifically, Murray, because you recently spent five weeks in Rockhampton, I believe. Oh, it just says five. It was. Four it was a long five a weeks. Okay, so <laughs> it's a, a month-ish. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah. But this was to renovate a property and, and you went up there solo without the whole family, solo. yeah? Yeah. T talk to me about energy management. How are you doing this? You're being away from the family, away from the wife, the kids, like, and you're just there by yourself renovating. Just getting stuck into it. Yeah. How, how are you doing this, man? Oh, it was an absolute whirlwind. And um, basically, you know, we'll... The, the tenants moved out and I, I jumped in and just got stuck right into it, you know, the interior, exterior painting, roof restoration, even done a bit of change, the bit of cabinetry in the kitchen, you know, mm -hmm. far out. We even, I even laid some concrete in the laundry because um, that was just a Man, mess. It had like old carpet in the laundry and when he pulled it up, there was like rat's a rat's nest. nest carpet like in the dead, laundry. Oh, it's a good rat. idea. Yeah, 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 it's a great idea. So, <laughs> but anyway, so it was just, I just had to do it. Like I think in a situation like that, I just, I just like, all right, I'm just, I psyched myself up and I'm just, I'm just doing it. And I was doing some pretty big days because I wanted to get back home to my family. How, how big's a big day? Oh, it was like, I'm getting up in the dark and like working till like, you know, Eight nine o'clock at night, sort of thing. So, so you're smashing like proper 14, 16 hour days. I like. think a 14 hour day was a small day. Yeah, wow. Yeah. But, but then, yeah, the first week or so, the tenants were in there and I was doing the exterior, so I could only do eight to nine hours a day. So, but as soon as they moved out, it was just game on, you know? And, and so you're literally working every day that whole time? Would you have a couple of days off in there, just a bit of recharge? I or worked basically every day. While the tenants were in there, I couldn't work the Sunday. So I had okay. Sunday off for the first two weeks I was up there. Yep. And then after that, the rest of the you know, two weeks or so, it was just every day, all day, because I was just I just wanted to get it done. So I get it rented and just get it back home to the family. Got that nice was. uplift. And, and, the rent. and what was the uplift in the end? What what you end up from uh three eighty a week to four fifty a week. Excellent. And equity wise? We paid two thirty five for that property. Yep. In May 23, and it's now worth about 350 to 380. Okay, so you've got a cash flow uplift, you've got an equity uplift alongside some market growth as well. Was it worth it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah? Yeah. It's helping you get to the next one? Yeah. I yeah, and just got like a nicer tenant in there that's going to take care of the yeah. place. So that's like a major thing for us is we want our properties to be well presented because we want 
people to take care of them. Mm-hmm. If they're not well presented, then like you get the kind of people that don't want something nicely presented. So you know, because being us, we bought it like you know, it was a tied tied property. You know, it needed it needed a bit of love. It needed a bit of work just to get it back up. You know, up up and running again. So it definitely did need you know painting and all, all the things that needed to be done. You know. So I'm not hearing any kind of like, um, I, I, I did this, this and this, or I had this ritual or you're just very much uh, what well, you both are just to get it done mentally. Yeah. yeah. Just so get was, up in the morning and just, all right, what am I doing today? And just sort of set maybe like daily goals. Like, you know, like, all right, today I'm going to just, you know, painting, I'm going to paint this side of the house or do this and just try and set these goals. Because if, if you, if you'd set a goal and you're going to, and you'd actually complete it for the day, you, you, you're stoked and it feels like you're actually on time and you're getting somewhere and you know so that sort of pushes you for the next day and just do it in a lot in increments you know that real um, feeling of progress yeah exactly progress yeah yeah, yeah. I'll tell you painting is a very satisfying trade you just get very quick gratification yeah apart so, from cutting in i can't stand cutting yeah. in. that's why we get we get hired it's not for everyone what do you guys think of the shoreline edge of tools nah. oh no? uh, it was sort of it yeah. looks like a bit of a gimmick oh, yeah no. okay nah. it, it'd be nice it's like could be too too uh too good to be true i reckon yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I use them every now and then, but I've noticed that they're, they're useless on a wall when you're doing it in like an older place because yeah. if everything's not actually quite straight That's and then right. it just wobbles it down the just, wall. Yeah, yeah. 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 So before I've, I've got another question for yourself, Esther, but before I do this, something else I wanted to touch on finance wise. Now, you guys were setting this up in like a company trust structure yeah. for one of the rentals or a few of them? All of them. All of them. So because we have our own business – and our own home, we, with discussions with our mortgage broker, we decided to purchase every property in a separate trust. And then that way our borrowing capacity was sort of rolled over into each next purchase. So like it didn't really cap out. And is this is something that you did from the start? Not from the very start. It's one of the reasons that we decided to sell the duplex okay. because we realised it was holding us back and we didn't need two properties in the town we lived in. We were pretty like it's had an insane amount of growth and it's not growing insanely right now. Mm-hmm. So we kind of went through the process of realising that by selling that and buying multiple properties in a cheaper location that we would actually end up with more growth overall. Which we should have done in the first place, but hindsight. Yeah, but it was a good stepping yeah. stone. Yeah. And yeah. that's how we look at it. We try to look back on things with like a positive yeah, yeah. a positive outlook, like try and see what you've learned from I, everything you've been through. I think we've done like 600 odd episodes now, something along those lines. I don't think I've ever interviewed one person that's like, I nailed it from the beginning. Yep, no, no it wouldn't change. <laughs> every, every, there's always learnings along the way. Yeah. This is how it works. But the important thing is you, you recognise them and you're like, oh, wait a second, I wish you could have done that better. Yes. Yeah, so then next time you're like, you're more educated, you've learnt along the way. Exactly. Yeah. Now the fact that you guys are set up with uh, to the right trust structures in pretty much all of your rentals, borrowing power wise, you're in a much stronger position mm-hmm. to keep moving forward, aren't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Except this last financial year wasn't as strong as the one before. Okay. Hence why we bought three properties in one year. And so what's the goal moving forward then? Are you kind of revising the timeline on the goal or? I think the next goal we're sort of um, going to tidy up all our loans because mm-hmm. we did buy with a third tier lender to yep. get into deals. Because again, like looking long term, not short term. So we don't care about a higher interest rate if it's getting us into the deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and with the amount of growth we've made already, it's like well more than what we've paid in the extra interest. You're paying an extra few thousand yeah. dollars in interest if it's getting you tens of thousands exactly. of dollars in equity. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. yeah. So the next plan sort of moving forward is to restructure a lot of our loans. Okay. Bring them back all, to a first or second. Yeah, yeah. Because they're all sort of um, holding their own anyway. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I guess once we've had a certain amount of growth, we'd like to consolidate, like sell something and consolidate some of the debt on our own home. And then that way that'll, that'll increase. Yeah. We've got lots of plans. (laughs) That'll increase our borrowing capacity again um, in the trust structure because our personal borrowing capacity will have gone down. And your uh, your personal borrowing capacity or you mean personal debt? Like personal debt will have gone down? Yeah, the personal so, debt will have gone down. So our yep. borrow, our borrowing capacity in the trusts will have gone up. 
Gotcha. Two of the properties we've purchased have got dual street access. Mm -hmm. So the long-term plan is to put a granny flat on those properties. And increase the cash flow even further. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I'm sure there's going to be a deal behind that, like finding a granny flat on Marketplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, Definitely. in Northern Queensland, you want them to be pretty solid. Yeah. So, Absolutely. yeah, we won't really want to cut corners on that. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as the keys, this is what I, I really wanted to, to start sort of rounding things out with. If there were three things that you would look at and go, look, these are probably the most important things that if you want to build a portfolio, when you've actually got kids, what would you say, Esther, would be those those three most important ones that if you were to take them away, it's just not happening. You're not doing it. I think you definitely need to expand the way you're thinking. Like, you you know, if you come up with a problem, you need to think outside the box to try and, you know, work out how to overcome that problem. Don't just see it as a roadblock and give up. You need to, you know, we're very much like we don't, follow the herd we just do our own thing and that's worked really well for us every problem um, has a solution yeah yeah it really does doesn't even it? if that solution is like waiting a little while like mm. you just you can't if you really want something you can't always have it straight away like you need to be prepared to work for it and maybe wait a little while okay so don't give up expand your thinking no doesn't always mean no in this industry. If someone's saying, no, you can't do it, it's like, we'll just Find keep asking the question. Say yes, yeah. You okay. need to educate yourself. Educate yourself as much as you can, whether it's like reading, listening. The thing I love most about podcasts is that they're all current. They're all up to date. Mm -hmm. Everything you're hearing on them is like relevant now. So, you know, we've spent hours and hours and hours listening to podcasts and it gets you really motivated, but also it gets you really educated. Mm. What, what's do you guys listen to audio books as well yes Murray does so what's a book that really changed things for you Murray like what, what would you be able to recommend uh, Robert Kiyosaki Rich Dad Poor Dad yeah. it's it's a classic but it's it's up there isn't it it is certainly yeah it's an absolute classic and it's just it just opened my eyes and just really got me psyched to uh, you know business wise and in, in property as well you know like it's just really motivating yeah if, if you've been in the investing circles for a little while you'll know that and you'll hear that that is a very common answer if you're like rich dad poor dad i've never heard of it mm -hmm. absolutely like take murray's advice on this and read the book it's brilliant robert kiyosaki's kind of changed a little bit over the years but his earlier work is it's yeah. phenomenal as far as just explaining investing, how it works. And from I personally, I feel like the power in that book is telling it from an eight-year-old's perspective of learning the world. And it just makes it so easy to understand and relatable. But it's like high-level stuff in, in some it parts. It certainly is, yeah. So yeah. if we're talking about expanding your thinking, educating yourself, what's the third and final key, Esther, that you think you, you have to have this to do it? Oh, I mean, if you're doing it as a a couple as a family, you need to be working together towards the same goal. It doesn't mean that you both actively have to be in it, but you've got to support each other. What keeps you guys on track, like together? Because it's it's so easy to bicker, especially like you're working together, you, everything's together. What's I mean, we like each other. That helps. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we do. A lot of people ask us all the you time, know? how can we work with each other? You know, oh, I wouldn't work with my missus, but I love it. Oh, we bicker, mm -hmm. but like right. you bicker with your friends. It's all part of like how you overcome things. So, you know, you overcome challenges. It's not always comfortable. So. So if someone's thinking that I'd love to do this, but my other half's not on board, my husband, my wife, they're just like, nah, can we just eat some Doritos and play Halo? Like what, what would you guys say when it comes to like, because were you both on board or would, in the beginning, was it I like- I had no clue. I thought it was so out of reach. Okay. I had to plant the seed. Yeah. He's and I was sort of, you know, oh, you know, we should listen to this podcast and, you know, try and like, you know, as in, you know, at least, you know, educating, you know, sort of planting the seed with, with education, like podcasts, audio books and things. And, and when Esther started working, you know, painting with me, it was, you know, because we just listened to the podcast or the radio, you know, through the radio and whatnot. And, uh, yeah, it finally yeah. took off. Took off. You started well, hearing really. it going, wait a sec, this this sounds all right. Yeah, it just made sense. Made okay. so much sense. So okay. solidarity, really? Yeah. It's that camaraderie. It is. That yeah. you, you need to have. Yeah. Because I, I, I 
totally back that up as well. I've had relationships in the past that I was the one dragging them down the street going, let's do this in property investing. And it doesn't work. Mm. Like B and I, I would like to think have a very similar relationship to what it sounds like you guys have. And it's transformative. Like it is, it is a totally different experience investing when you're both on the same page and you're both marching to the beat of the same oh, drum. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it is an unstoppable force, really. And it's know, great now, both. like once Murray like got me started mm -hmm. and he has so much faith in me, he just lets me go. So <laughs> like he sort of runs the show at the painting business. You're the property um, one. And I'm the property. So when it comes to it, like if, if I come to him and I say this location, yep. this property – he wants me, he goes, okay, why? And I tell him why. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, he lets me do my thing. And, and what was the nickname he's given you now? The Property Monster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's turned it into a Property Monster. <laughs> uh, I, I love this, guys. And I just, personally, the, the big reason I really wanted to, to create this with both of you is because I, I think, one, it's just awesome what you've created anyway, like doing this with a young family or not, but doing that when you've got little ones, because the, the, it's not that you've got teenagers that are like 19, 20 years old. You, what are they, five, seven? What were they again? Four, four and seven. Four and seven. Yeah. Okay. So when you guys started this, there's like proper little people. Now they're still the children, children. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. This, this is already a challenge, raising a family, building a business, and now building a portfolio on top of it. I just think it's absolutely incredible what you've done. And there's going to be a lot of people listening to this that even if they just take one little piece of it to go, okay, may maybe it's more so strengthening the, the relationship between us that we need to do first to then be able to push forward. Maybe it's the problem solving aspect that we really need about to work together on to go, all right, you're really good at that. You're really good at that. And this is going to help us move forward. Maybe it's sitting with a broker that actually goes, yeah, well, we can do this using mm -hmm. a bit of equity. Given you, you guys had a, a decent amount of equity to start with, you don't need that much to start. No, like, no. It was great that you did, but but you, it's not actually necessary because you also did it on a very modest household income of would you say around a hundred ish grand when you very yeah, first started? Yeah. yeah, the first the first investment property was bought with yeah we're well, on a hundred grand a year. For anyone listening that wants an action step, pull out the headphones, something they can put into practice straight away. Who would like to to take this one? What's the best action step? Well, I know everybody says that yeah probably says this all the time, but to be honest, like I just you know, just listen to educate yourself. Podcasts, mm. audio books. I think that's a major action step. For, yep. You know, just listen as much as you yep. can. Absorb. Just absorb it all. Yeah. I find the more that you do that as well, the more it becomes normal. The more it becomes normal, the more it's like, why aren't I doing this? And it just removes mm. that barrier of like that. Something I say all the all the time. Uh, what is it again? Uh, I normalize, don't idolize. Mm -hmm. And it's so important because as soon as someone's on a pedestal or some things on a pedestal. It feels out of reach. Yeah. But it's like when that's just, oh, you, you've got other friends that you talk to in networks and groups and communities that do this as well. It's like, well, this is just standard. This mm -hmm. is how life works now. Well, yeah, you are the people that you surround yourself with. Yeah. What's that they call it? Like your top five friends. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's uh, the, the median income of your top five is your income most of the time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, on a lighter note and arguably the most important question of the entire show, I need to ask you both or a collective answer. Like I said, I don't interview two people at once very often. <laughs> what, Esther and Murray, what is your favourite pizza? I know what Murray's answer will be, but um, my favourite pizza is Murray's homemade satay pizza. Satay pizza. And it yeah. has to have pineapple and banana on it. Oh, you're breaking all the rules. Yeah, okay. no, <laughs> exactly. We don't we don't follow the herd. <laughs> it's beautiful. It, really it is, is really good. This this is a Murray signature original by the sounds he of it. He hasn't paid it for me for ages either. So well, since pineapple I'm, and banana. Yeah. yeah. Well, how did this come about, mate? I've got to ask. I have no idea. I just sort of. <laughs> <laughs> it was like oh, there was a place down at home where I grew up, and they used to put banana on their pizza. That's right. And yeah. Then, yeah. I think and that's I where I got it from. It. it was really good. Yeah. I'm fascinated. I, I feel like next time it's like cheap or not. Yeah. Pretty tasty. Mm. Okay. All right. Let's talk a bit more detail yeah. about that off air. <laughs> 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 All right. So, Murray, you're, you're the man behind the satay pineapple banana pizza, but that's not your favorite pizza. What What's yours, mate? 
Yeah, I'd say uh, the meat lovers, barbecue meat lovers. Good old, you know, just straight meat lovers. Where are you getting it? The Cabobolo is always a good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cabarita Beach. Walking distance from home. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd imagine a pizza with a bit of a view. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's no, beautiful. Very nice. <laughs> Guys, I, I really appreciate you making the time to come down here because uh, I know it wasn't down the road for you. You've made a special trip. And I know that this is going to be a story that touches a lot of people. Is there any final words of wisdom or anything you'd like to leave everyone with today? I think, you know, when you look at those little people, your kids, um, you think like, what kind of example do you want to set to them? What do you want to show them? And I think it's really important. Our kids like look at us and they see us as a united front. We work together. We work towards the same goal. And I tell my son that we buy houses. So he has an choices in the future and like he's seven and he says thank you to me for that he says oh thanks mum that's like, lovely he gets it so like that's what it's all for like you you're doing it for your family i think that's a beautiful way to end it mm. esther and murray thank you so much for your time today and for, for coming on the us. show